All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. Today is my favorite day. So today is our heart to heart one on one. Today is our open forum. So welcome to the open forum. I hope you're all keeping yourself calm, happy and healthy. You are keeping yourself protected and um, stay protected and stay bl blessed. So let's start our discussion. There is a lot to be discussed. The questions today are really, really interesting. Some of those are on ivermectin, some are about vaccines, and then a bunch of other studies as well. So uh, we'll go through those, and we would go through the uh, questions here on live. So let's see. Um, DDS, greetings, cool bean, greetings back to you. Westfield, let's get Moderna shipping out. Absolutely, absolutely. And as we discussed yesterday, Moderna can actually be sent out to more sites in the US compared to the Pfizer because of Pfizer's storage need needs. So it is going to be really good once it is starting to go out. Margaret McInnes, welcome. Um, welcome from Maine. Hope the temperatures are not too cold and these there is not too much of snow. Uh, Francis, hi, cool beans and our king bean and chief Luffy head of <laughs> catnip research. Absolutely. Luffy wants me to, you know, get a vaccine quickly. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Shahid, assalamu alaikum. France, yeah, Moderna is in the house, yes. So, salam. Thank God Moderna doesn't require dry ice everywhere, absolutely. And the questions have started. Archana has the first question. Um, I'm practicing ENT specialist from India. I have been treating COVID patients for the past four months operating as well, but still not got COVID and my IgG is low. Why is it so? You Do you actually have IgGs? Because if you have IgG, that means you have become exposed. Lower IgG simply means that you were exposed somewhere in the past, then your, uh, your uh, memory cells are sleeping at this time, but they're just not producing as many of the titers. But if you get re-exposed, they would increase their production. But do you have actually COVID IgG? That means you got it at some point. Um, so that, that uh, Archana, thank you very much for getting us started. Jessica, welcome as well. She's from Boston. Um, and then Timothy, will radiation to the head and neck 30 years ago allow IVM M to pass? No, no, no. Um, hello from Oregon. Welcome. And Andrew, good evening. <laughs> Cheers, Anthony. Uh, France, happy Friday. Ha Cindy, happy Friday back to you as well. Old evening, uh, Dr. Bean and Cool Beans, hopefully you're saying good evening. So yes, Claire, good evening back to you as well. Uh, gold count country Russ D3 today, IVM soon, then maybe vaccine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what else? Um, <laughs> Man, there are so many questions already. Uh, JTJ, Pfizer's vaccine has been delivered to the local hospital here on the island of Martha's Vineyard. Very good. I have actually, I think I've been to, isn't Martha's Vineyard on the East Coast? Is it in yes, Rhode Island? No, near Maine. Have we been to Martha's Vineyard? No, we went to um, Bar Harbor. Rajesh, good evening. GM says, how long will the vaccine protect against COVID-19? So uh, I'll give you two answers. One is the technical answer and the other one is hypothetical answer on my opinion part. So the technical answer is that the uh, vaccine people are saying that we do not know more than the time we have given vaccine for. So they don't know. And they say that only time will tell. Now the hypothetical part or from the previous studies part, and you would see today, uh, keep an eye out for this, that there are so many studies that I would discuss for which months ago, we had already given our hypothesis that we think that from the previous infections, this behavior is going to be the following way. And the newer studies are actually just proving them. 
so it is not that i uh, had actually more knowledge than others i just opened up the books from the previous years and saw how the sars cov 1 and mers cov had done so the technical part is that they do not know the hypothetical part or or previous knowledge part is that once you develop the immunity to coronaviruses that immunity normally lasts robustly for 2 years and then it starts declining for 1 year so by 3 years end the immunity stops but by that time the virus should have been uh, adapted and gone then the cytotoxic t cell part so this is the humoral cell that is 2 to 3 years that is antibodies the cytotoxic part can actually continue to be robust for decades so that is what should be expected jim welcome from iowa um david says when the immune system produces igg igm and igg how do you know if it is covid 19 and not another infection causing resonance the uh, the only way to know that is to actually bind them to covid so react them with covid spike proteins or covid that is how they do it so we always have lots of iggs and igms that are running around in our blood but we pick up the blood and react it to the specific antigens that we want to test for and that is how we know it is against uh, sars cov 2 uh, rubina good morning as well good evening as well uh, mohammed thanks uh, sir you're most welcome uh, westfield said that after 9 months we are still seeing rising death rates meaning that we do not have any standard protocols or drugs that can be used reliably um we have drugs that can be used reliably we do not have the leadership approving them i think that is i want to say criminal and it is really really sad uh, somebody had been tweeting i think rob from florida and another person with him they were talking about somebody in their families not doing well and then uh, i think rob's rob's family is fine there is somebody else whose uh, family member is not doing well and they would not give them ivermectin and ivermectin is a safe drug so what if you give it to at least give the patient a chance to survive so that it just blows my mind that there is so much i have i am at a loss of words i used to call it indifference then i said it was uh, deliberate indifference I, i'm at a loss of words for how doctors can do that barbara hello uh, L- lauren says my son tested negative but he can't smell so that means that there is something um, possibly related to sars cov 2 the test negative is a very common thing nowadays good evening stretlize janet hello scruffy scrubs hello dr mubeen hello back to you as well susan hello from florida rajesh um achna yes of course achna is doing a great job um simple garden welcome d welcome and uh, greg says i hope you know how much we greatly appreciate you i am actually grateful for your time for your coming along for being part of this journey um you do not know how much that means to me as well um christian raheem says are there any serological tests that can detect active new infection uh if you're saying active new infection of the sars cov 2 yes igm's presence is usually an indicator of active new infection igm usually rises up with the new infection stays on for a couple of weeks and then finishes and igg takes over in case of covid-19 igg and igm both go up together then igg persists declines a little bit in 2 3 months but it persists and igm goes away so presence of igm usually is indication of a new disease or reactivation of the disease andrew says have you looked into the traditional chinese medicine herbs uh, for covid no i have not and um, uh, please send me some links that i can look at greetings from jordan back to you ala uh, barbara diaz and hello's there F- frankie 
What are your thoughts on monoclonal antibody infusion? My 78 year mom tested positive today doing okay. Can't get infusion until Tuesday due to scheduling does not have pneumonia, thankfully. So it looks like she is generally fine, but COVID-19 progresses very fast. It is a matter of days that it progresses fast. So hopefully praying that this does not happen. Hopefully she's taking the supplements, she's staying healthy, um, but monoclonal would be great. I wish people could get Regeneron. And I am, uh, that is one area where I am very upset. I usually don't care for the politicians because I do not really respect the way they behave. They are just, they're going to do whatever is best for them. Uh, but in case of, look at Trump and Giuliani both. Uh, advanced age, possibly they, they could become serious. Uh, I do not wish it on anyone. Within two days, they were brought out by giving Regeneron. Why is Regeneron not given to others? I think that uh, Margaret had mentioned, and Ma Margaret, I, that is what I recall. My apologies if you had not said it, that Regeneron, if somebody else has said it, said it thank you. Uh, Regeneron can be given on asking. So if that is the case, please make sure that other than monoclonal antibodies, maybe ask them that, hey, can we get Regeneron? So real world, great question, David Rogers. So where is the question? Let's see, David's question. If you prefix your questions with a question mark or the Q or the word question, it becomes easier for me to kind of find it. Otherwise I just have to scroll through and try to find them. Okay, so there was a question today that um, how was, okay, very good. Very good real world. Uh, so there was a question today that uh, how did we, what is the age of Luffy and how did we name him Luffy and do we have other cats? So here is Luffy and Kairi. So we have two cats. Uh, we got them from a breeder when they were very young, I think five or six months or even younger. Um, they are both six years now. We had actually gone to get Kairi. Kairi is the one that is a little dark. So these are both Bengals. We had gone to get Kairi, but Luffy was just hanging with her all the time. And wherever Kairi would go, Luffy would go there. So we uh, asked them to give us Luffy as well. So that is how uh, we ended up with Luffy too. So um, Luffy, they both are six years old, old. Their names are from manga characters. So my wife was the one who named them. So both Luffy and Kairi are manga or some manga game characters. So that is how their name um, <laughs> were decided. So with this, let's continue. Uh, Wayne says that yesterday nurse faints during TV interview and right have getting the vaccination shot. Uh, right up during the it is possible there are some people who actually faint normally fainting is not anaphylactic unless the reaction was so much that the cardiac system stopped or the the uh, airway choked uh, I do not know exactly what happened so I'll have to look at the video to see Jason says, what's the difference between the COVID vaccine flu vaccine and the polio varicella vaccines basic basic general idea that the, the way the vaccines work is that we look at some antigen on a specific pathogen, and then we make antibodies against it. Sorry, I'm talking, we produce that vaccine, we produce that antigen and give it to our body to look at it and become trained. So of course that means COVID vaccine would have like spike proteins. Flu vaccine has a piece of the flu virus that our body is trained about. Same case for the polio and varicella vaccines. Then the, the question is, what kind of virus? Is it attenuated? Is it weakened? Do we have an adjuvant in there and not? So there are differences in the composition as well. So um,
So thank you very much, J3 Any. Uh, hi, Dr. Bean. I'm not a doctor, but I think I'm, I am a 30 year med tech and specialist in blood banking. This is the best show on YouTube. Thank you very much. And I can tell you that, uh, so Margaret was talking with me a few days ago and I was, uh, she was asking me, or we were just ch chatting that, did you plan to do this? I did not plan to do this. My original reason to do this was the that letter that somebody fake letter in the name of Stanford somebody wrote that you should take steam and you should take hot water and that would kill the virus and so on and it was so bad somebody forwarded to me and said can you comment on that and I felt that people would die if they followed that letter so I did the first video out of that um, uh, reaction that this is going to cause issues and when that when I did, I have said it many times before. At that time, Matt Cram had done many videos, Campbell had done many videos. So I thought that what would I do with one video? So, but I still had enough of a drive to do that. And then the next day I did one more, and the next day I did one more. And this is how, and then we started becoming a tribe as well, and we started joining hands together to continue to navigate this time together. So that is how it happened. Um, my belief has always been that medical professionals should be educated and they should understand the medical concepts enough that they can be thinkers, not just followers that we say, give this medication, this disease, give this drug, this disease, give this drug. So they should not just be that, they should be thinkers as well. So my original belief is that we need to continue to explain medical concepts. This became a slightly deviation from that, and that is we became focused on COVID, plus we became more of a, not just medical professional, but everyone. And I think at this time, it was important for all of us to understand medical concepts related to COVID. And I think in this process, we became a lot of immunologists as well. The importance was to understand these concepts so that we can think for ourselves and not get trapped by rumors and myths and the disinformation and the scary tactics and those things. So I think we uh, we did well for majority of that uh, concept. So Stratolyze says, can someone with leukemia in remission take Regeneron or monoclonal antibodies after blood transplant? Yes, yes. So ideally these antibodies are not going to interplay with leukemia because they are just going to look at the virus and attack that. So it should be OK, but again, uh, talk with your doctor and have a better understanding because they would have all of your labs available. D says, how much capacity does our immune system have to prepare memory cells for all the different vaccines that we receive? Can they reach saturation? No. So our body is amazing in this way that we make copies of the B cells or memory. We make memory cells. We do not make it tons of them. We make them and we shelve them. We put them on a shelf. Then when the, the infection actually occurs, then they activate, divide, increase in number, and then they start producing the antibodies. When they have done their function, the, the infection is taken care of, then the extra cells will die and a few memory cells will remain. So we would never reach the saturation. That is how our body manages it. <clears throat> Skyfly says, have you heard about the new strain circulating? Any data about if the Pfizer vaccine covers this? So the new strain, I'm, I'm sure you're talking about the UK strain. And uh, so far, it is thought that the Pfizer vaccine would cover it. Um, there is not enough information for the deviation. There are some mutations in it, which include some mutations on the spike protein as well. But so far, they are still trying to figure out if the uh, and the vaccines would continue to work. I think they would. Uh, Max Flo says, I'm really healthy, but my WBC is 3.7. Is this too low? I was in antihistamines for a while. Max, I cannot really um, make a conjecture for why this is happening. Ideally, a bunch of labs need to be present and a trend of the labs need to be present to be able to say it. The, the, the lifestyle, the other situation in the body, the uh, the the way you your health has been, all of those have to come together. 
I I am not in that state to to comment on that. So Claudia says, do you still agree with zinc and ICQ combination? Yes, yes, I do. I have found ivermectin to be much more faster, rapid in its action, and much more effective and less, less uh, side effects. But yes, zinc and hydroxy or zinc and quercetin are important. Uh, our mRNA is safer than others. In my opinion, mRNA are better because no adjuvants are there, no antibiotics are there, no preservatives are there. It's simple genetic material for the spike protein wrapped in a lipid nanoparticle and given to us. So much, much decent compared to others, but others are, for example, AstraZeneca is fine as well. Then there is this, this uh, concept of fetal tissue versus not fetal tissue. So these uh, mRNA vaccines have nothing to do with the fetal tissues as well. So for those who are sensitive to this issue, they can actually easily take these. Kathleen, um, Kathleen says, will you be getting a shot? Absolutely. As soon as I can be given an opportunity, I'm going to get it. Do you consume the ivermectin tabs right away as prophylaxis or will till the first whiff of COVID? So um, I do not have the ivermectin here with me, but all my family members who can take ivermectin and make it available for themselves, I have asked them to take it once a week. Uh, what Raza says, why is it easier to get treated for COVID in Pakistan or Bangladesh than the UK or US? I think this may be a rhetorical question. In UK, US and other European countries, the laws and regulations around the healthcare system are very strict. And there are, uh, you can say the, this is just maturity of the, the communities or societies, or you can also say that this is something to do with the big pharma and, and the um, corporates that are playing their part. This is also, I believe, some bureaucracy, the red tape. I think that these societies are actually very well tuned that in general, uh, without a pandemic, they can take care of their people very nicely. Again, uh, not having insurance for everyone is a different topic. But uh, when the pandemic occurred, these systems had no ways of actually coming out of their run of the mill behavior and then uh, jumping up and doing something exceptional. I always say it that this is an exceptional time and our behavior has to be exceptional. So they did, the bureaucracy did not show exceptional behavior to help us. That is why we got stuck. And the countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, and other, they can go get ivermectin over the counter and, and take them, uh, treat themselves. Uh, I know so many of the patients who have been treating themselves at home by themselves. They have learned that vitamin D and zinc and quercetin and, and other things with aspirin and with ivermectin. So they do that their whole thing by themselves. They can go get oxygen as well. So it's the lack of strict regulation in these countries has actually benefited them during the pandemic. Everyone go to your Facebook now and post one word, Ivermectin, that is true. Um, Buffer Master, question, what are the risks of Bell's palsy from the new vaccine? The news has reported concerns about Bell's palsy as a side effect, thank you. So Buffer, both Pfizer and Moderna had people that developed Bell's palsy. In both cases, they said the, the rate of occurrence of the disease is similar to the rate of occurrence of the disease in general population. Still, my, um, my comment was that the placebo side, for example, in I think in Moderna, three Bell's palsy in the vaccine side and one on the placebo side. So that is not the same rate. But still, the numbers are too low to actually significantly compare them. Similar situation with Pfizer as well. So uh, fortunate thing is that they recovered. So that means it doesn't seem to be a permanent issue. But to me, it seems like there is something to do with the vaccine, but it is not known. Skyfly says, really enjoying the session. Such so the questions have started flying. So yes. Um, So 
So uh, Quentin Lewis says, I have heard another teaching doctor talk about the possible value of contrast showers on immunity. How do you feel about them? And have you covered that before? No. Uh, tell me a little bit more about them or maybe give me a link. I This is the first time I'm hearing that contrast showers for uh, COVID or immunity. So uh, 1x2 says, question, are the spike proteins identical? The binding part of the spike protein that connects with the ACE receptor is identical. So that is what is the, uh, most of this virus is very stable in its genetics because it has a proof reading enzyme in it. So when the genetic material mutates, its own proof reader comes and corrects it. So because of that, it is quite stable. It is still mutating. It mutates very slowly. And most of the binding areas are staying the same, which is fortunate for us. Uh, Muhammad Zubair says, it has been seen that people treated aggressively have better outcomes than those quarantined at home and waiting to get worse than uh, taking medical opinion. Absolutely. So early and aggressive treatment. The first rule is don't let it happen. So prophylaxis. Second rule is if it happens, treat right away and get the patient out within two, three days. That is what we saw with, uh, with Trump and with Giuliani. And the important thing is that treating early not only reduces the chances of somebody progressing to death, it also reduces the chances of long hauler. So uh, you are correct. So um, can you kick five sites? Absolutely. Where is five site? When I see him next, I would get him out. Um, OK, so. I see five site and five site, you are gone. OK, done. <clears throat> so Diego says, tell me the cost of the vaccine, US dollar. So of course, I think we will get it for free in the US. But the cost is, I believe, Moderna is $29. Pfizer is $20, or $19 or so. And then some of the Chinese or, or Sinovac type vaccines are about $10. Imperial College's vaccine is even one or two dollars. So Mary Esther Dush says, my daughter-in-law is negative, but has all the symptoms of COVID. She's going tomorrow for another test negative for flu also. That is an interesting situation that many tests are coming up negative. So if clinically somebody is, uh, they, they look like COVID, then you should assume they have COVID and start treating accordingly. Um, Cindy, I have not seen the U.S. mink situation. I knew that the uh, over here, the minks are also getting infected. What I did not know was that how did they handle them? So I'll have to look it up. Uh, VM about J&J. So I was thinking that uh, coming week, I would be talking about the Johnson & Johnson's, AstraZeneca, Sinovac, and the CanSino vaccines as well. So we'll do a, a talk about them. So uh, contrast showers increase the blood flow to face, nose, improves the blood circulation and immunity system to attack any virus in the upper respiratory tract. That sounds fine. Wherever the blood flow, our body's behavior is also to increase blood flow where there may be an uh, infection or injury. That is why those areas become red and inflamed and painful because the blood flow had is increased so that more nutrients can come there and more immune cells can come there and help. So if there is something that would help increase the blood flow, that, that works. So I'm not even able to go to the Twitter because we have a flurry of questions right here. Skyfly says, I'm from South Africa. Any current estimates on vaccine delivery to African nations? Ivermectin had to come by at the moment. Sky, um, this is going to be different from country to country. It depends what the country is doing to get the vaccine. So I do not know 
if South Africa has talked with Pfizer or Oxford or CanSino or Sinovac or Moderna. So I think that is what would happen. Uh, so you, you'll have to ask your healthcare authorities to say, what are you guys doing about the vaccine? When are we going to get it? So Kismina says, are you worried about the people that people will not be willing to get vaccinated? How dangerous it is? So quite dangerous. Uh, yes, I'm worried about it. And tomorrow I want to actually talk about it in detail that when the vaccines become available, then what is our population's composition and what is the role of vaccine in there? And then what is the possibility of people who would not get the vaccine and how would that result? What would happen if that happens? Uh, at the same time, any anti-vaxxer who is here, I have kept myself very neutral about this. I do not think that I want to use this platform, which started with this belief that we should educate ourselves to be able to protect better. So I do not want to um, badmouth anyone or push anyone back. Because if they're not going to get the vaccine, then maybe supplements would help. Maybe ivermectin would help. Maybe something else would help. So uh, I, in my personal opinion, it is wrong to not take the vaccine because not only you are endangering yourself, but you would continue to propagate the infection for a longer period of time and put others at risk as well. At the same time, I understand that people say, hey, I had my child and we gave them vaccine and there is some damage and we think that we are we are apprehensive. And I understand that. And so I, I would not take a position here. Instead, what I would do is I'll continue to provide education and, and information so then people can make their own decision for what is right for them. So um, Anu says, how do you make sure that you don't have COVID before taking vaccine? That is when we are asymptomatic. The thing is this, why would you want to know that? It is okay if you had the virus and you have tackled it, asymptomatic even better. That means you didn't even uh, bat an eye and you took care of it. Vaccine is nothing. It's just five milli, uh, 0.5 milliliter of spike protein. It's, it's gonna, your body is gonna say whatever. So this is a very important question, and people have asked this many, many times. Jamie Cost James Costa says, will taking prophylactic ivermectin prevent acquiring antibodies? So let me draw this, because I think we talk about it almost on a daily basis. So let's look at it. Actually, my drawing hand is itching to draw. So let me very quickly explain this. Look, the way, the way ivermectin works is that <clears throat> When the virus arrives in our cell, so let's say here is the SARS-CoV-2, and it has its spike proteins and everything, this virus releases its messenger RNA in our cytoplasm. Cytoplasm means outside the nucleus, inside the cell. This messenger RNA goes to a ribosome in our, in our cell and gets to be translated into various proteins. Some of these proteins, some of these proteins enter the nucleus by binding to another set of our proteins and they go into the nucleus and tell the nucleus, they're like nucleus DNA whisperers. They go to DNA and say, do not protect yourself. So they block the opening up of the genes for interferon, for example. So they block that. The result is that the cell cannot tell others to become strong and cell cannot defend its own self as well. This is the primary function. The other function is that it helps modulate immune system plus it reduces inflammation. However, now, oh, sorry, so this is the function of the SARS-CoV-2. The presence of ivermectin, what that does is it blocks this entry of the viral carbo into the nucleus. So because that entry is blocked, the cell stays strong and it keeps sending interferon signals to the, to the nearby cells and keeps them strong as well. So this is not an antiviral behavior. The ivermectin's behavior is not an antiviral behavior. Instead, it is a behavior to prop up the cells. 
Now, in the meantime, the cells are also going to be presenting the antigen, the SARS-CoV-2's antigen on their surface, which would then cause various immune cells. So for example, naive T cell, then that goes T helper two cell, then that goes B cell. And similarly, it is possible that T helper one pathway is taken and then the cytotoxic T cell is uh, activated. This activation of the immune system is not interfered by the ivermectin at all. So that means if somebody is taking prophylactic and ivermectin or ivermectin for other reasons and they get vaccine, vaccine is going to do the same thing, this part. And so ivermectin would not interfere with that. Very good, Jan. So I finally convinced my stepdaughter to vaccinate her children. Turns out she was worried about the adjuvant side effects. So uh, both Pfizer and Moderna do not have adjuvants, which is a good thing. Um, no worries. Uh, welcome. OK, so should I open up the Twitter as well or talk more here for now? So. And Kato says, can you explain what ADE is? 1.3 billion Indians will get the adenovirus-based AstraZeneca vaccine. Really worried. Is it an instant reaction? So uh, yes, I can explain what it is. And first punchline or takeaway is don't be worried. And now let me show you what it is. So look, what happens is this is a theoretical concept. We have not observed this with COVID-19 because if ADE could happen with COVID-19, then first infection of COVID and then re-exposure, which I would assume anybody who has become infected and, and healed or recovered or conval convales convalesced has the antibodies in them and they would be open for ADE if ADE was happening. So let's see what happens. What happens is that first time when an antigen comes into our body. So let's say this is an antigen. This rounded little structure is an antigen. When that antigen comes into our body and our cells pick it up, they present it onto themselves and that causes the naive T cell to become active. Naive T cell would then make become T helper 2 in the absence of interleukin 12 or in the presence of interleukin 4. T helper 2 will then cause B cell, B cell to become a plasma cell, which is an active B cell, which is making antibodies. The concept of ADE is the following. These antibodies, as they're fighting with the virus, they can also go and get attached to mast cells, for example. Or they can attach to macrophages or other cells. So now imagine if the virus arrives again or the virus is present, now the antibody, so here is the virus. Normally, this virus, SARS-CoV-2, will have to enter into our cell by binding to ACE2 receptor. So if we take ACE2 receptor here or enzyme ACE2, Normally, what would happen is that the SARS-CoV-2 will have to bind with the ACE2 to enter into our cell. And that entry is controlled. However, and the SARS-CoV-2 have no other mechanism to enter. And uh, I know that there, somebody had made a comment on, on YouTube. It is interesting that when people make a comment, they also make sure that they put some sort of an insult out as well by saying, hey, do you not know this? And what kind of a doctor are you? I have discussed these things in detail in the past, so I do not want to repeat everything every time. Uh, it is possible that the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 is endocytosed, or it is possible that it is fused with the cell membrane, but it still has to attach with the ACE2 first, and then it can get into the cell. So let's assume for our discussion here that SARS-CoV-2 cannot enter a cell without binding to ACE2. Now, if there are antibodies present against SARS-CoV-2, then what, the, what would happen is that imagine that antibody is attached here. Our immune cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, neutrophils, um, mast cells, they have receptors for antibodies. So imagine this is an antibody against SARS-CoV-2 
and the SARS, it has captured a SARS-CoV-2 virus. Good. Now this captured complex is now connected with the macrophage or dendritic cell. Now what would happen is this macrophage or dendritic cell can take this inside. That is the function. But normally when this complex is brought in, the complex is, is brought in into the form of a phagocytic vacuole or they, you can think about it that this particular thief is put in a box and then brought into the jail. So here what happens is this antibody with the virus is internalized into the cell in the form of a phagocytic capsule. Then we beat up the virus and then we present it. In the case of antibody dependent enhancement, this becomes an extra path for the virus to come in. But the condition is that the virus has to be able to come in, get itself rid of the antibody, come out of this little vacuole, and then infect the cell. SARS-CoV-2 has not been observed to do all of those things. So should we be worried about antibody dependent enhancement? In theory, yes, but in practice, no. So <clears throat> that was a good question. So Mini says, how do we prevent vitamin D overdosage? Ideally, just check your blood levels maybe once every quarter and then don't take very crazy amounts <laughs> so this is what is very common a few uh, today i saw an, uh, a comment as well where the commenter was saying how much money have they give, given you to purchase you and your voice and it is, I have got no money other than cool beans sometimes supporting me. I have no money from anyone. So uh, these kind of things, you are being lied to. The white coat priesthood is owned by Big Pharma. The government health agencies are guided by the uh, who wants global government. So uh, again, Nightwatch, I do not know what is your point here. But um, at least we here are neutral and trying to protect ourselves. Okay, so um, let's now start uh, looking at the Twitter as well, and we'll go from there. How about that? So this this is a very good question, Yaba. And I talked about it yesterday. I talked about it the whole last week as well. Is it true that there is no data on whether the Pfizer vaccine affects fertility? Is it also true that there is no data as to how long this vaccine will be active for? So even yesterday I showed this data and I have specifically provided the links to their documentations and the study results. During the Pfizer vaccine trial, after the first dose, there were I think 11 women who were vaccinated and became pregnant. So there is nothing to do with infertility there. Similarly, uh, or fertility. Similarly, Moderna, there were six people who became, uh, six women who became pregnant. And I think seven of the placebo sites, so the rate was similar. So there was no issue in fertility. And today somebody sent me a message saying, what you do not know is that the vaccine is going to go and cause some issue with the uterine epithelial cells. And that is how people will become infertile. Look these vaccines are not so sophisticated to figure out that I am only going to attack the uterine epithelial cell. What is the vaccine has to do with the uterine epithelial cell? Vaccine are lipid particle injected into the deltoid muscle where they are immediately picked up by the muscle cells and the immune cells. They don't even go anywhere. And then the immune cells make the spike proteins and present them on their surface, there is no concept of vaccine going to the uterus. How sophisticated a drug has to be 
to be injected in the deltoid muscle and then know that I need to go to uterus. And then I have within the uterine layers, I have to find where's the epithelial layer and then only damage that layer and forget about the epithelial layer of the mouth and the GIT and the respiratory system and conjunctiva and nose and the rest of the reproductive system just going to attack the uterine. How is the how sophisticated that system would be? And then just to be uh, clear, our uterine layers in women, they shed every month as part of menstrual period. So let's say, let's give it, let's be devil's advocate that somehow the vaccine has gone and done something to the epithelial layer. So what? In this menstrual period, that layer is gone. Next menstrual period, there is a new layer. It happens every month with women. That does not cause infertility. So um, that itself, again, you are not saying it, but I, I'm responding to that message as well. And this weird message that somehow cat's uterus was damaged. Uh, these, these drugs are actually not tested on cats. They're not tested on cats. So uh, Yaba, your first question, fertility, no issues. It is also true that there is no data as to how long this vaccine will be active for. We don't know because there is not enough time gone. So when somebody says there is no data, this, there is also no data that this vaccine can drive a car. There is also no data that this vaccine can, you know, fly in a ship. These questions are similar. Uh, I know that you are asking them for educational purposes, but I am responding to general folks who are just causing disinformation. There is no con concept of uh, this vaccine not having this data. They, it doesn't do these things. Um. <laughs> I'm St. Clair. Sorry you have to put up with so much. You're a good egg and a great bean. Thank you very much. Th there is more. People actually threat me with the consequences. They say, you have been doing this and this is, they call me misinforming. I, I'm causing disinformation. And then they say, there are going to be consequences for you. So I get these kind of messages very, very common. In the beginning, I used to get worried. But now I, I just know that I'm doing something that... I, whenever I present something, I show you the evidence. So you can go and check that evidence. Now, if the evidence is wrong as well, then I'm wrong too. The second possibility of me being wrong is that evidence is correct, but I interpreted it wrongly or I presented it incorrectly because I didn't understand it well. Then that is my mistake. So Skyfly, any data on possible antigenic shift with SARS-CoV-2? So there is no antigenic shift, significant shift seen. So the concept of antigenic shift, shift, for example, with the flu virus is that flu virus changes every year so much that previous antibodies are not useful and we have to make new antibodies against it. Coronaviruses are not known to shift that much. It is mutating, but that mutational rate is very low. But And fortunate for us, it has a proofreading enzyme in it. So when it makes a copy of itself, the proofreader comes and makes sure that that copy is like before. So because of that, the mutational rates are really low, which is a good thing. So with this, let's also start looking at the... Uh, Thank you very much, Ranjit. Let's start looking at the Twitter as well. So this is drbean.com. There is one more thing. Somebody had asked me to put up a page on buy me a coffee. So some, somebody asked me that yesterday. So I have created a buy me a coffee page. So there is a link in the description for buy me a coffee. Uh, here is the Twitter. And these are all the links to the various things that are that have been asked in Twitter. And I have these links in the description as well. So let's look at it uh, one by one. So this one, doctor, could you please comment on this one? When I open it, 
it actually blocks me from going there. So I'm going to open it on a different computer and see what happens. Uh, Vic RB says, thoughts on safety of long weekly, bi-weekly, monthly ivermectin use given this information. So I had actually talked about this a few days ago as well. And that is that this uh, um, researchers say that they have seen ivermectin causing damage to our DNA. So what is missing, and I talked about it last time as well, what is missing from this is the dosage. Everything can be a poison if given in incorrect dose. So, so far, the dosage that is given for ivermectin is mostly therapeutic. The only difference, for example, when I talk with my own patients and treat them, I give them ivermectin, for example, five, six days. This therapeutic dose is actually only recommended once a three month or a six months or a year, depending upon the type of worm that we have. So that means it is slightly above the uh, dosage, therapeutic dosage. However, what I do is that I look at the pharmacokinetics to see how, how fast this drug is cleared. And based on that, I know that it is safe to do that. Here, they say that ivermectin can cause DNA damage or the cell, it can kill our cells. The question is, what is the dose? So the dose is not there. And if it is given in poisonous dose, then all the researchers have proved over here is that if you give a lot of dose, then it can be poisonous and they have given the mechanism of poisoning. So not very worrisome because the dose that is used regularly is very safe dose. So then the question is here, Vic RV elevated biomarkers found in pediatric patients with COVID has alarmed many. How would you interpret this? So here is that study. In this study, what they did was that they said that in children who are asymptomatic, when they take their blood and look at the biomarkers for uh, hemo, uh, what is that? Blood, not blood, the coagulation the complement system, they see the complement system biomarkers to be elevated in them. So that is a C5, C5B. So that is part of complement. I've done a discussion for the complement. That is hypercoagulable state. So they see that this state in children, however, children are asymptomatic. The same state when it occurs in adults, it causes issues for them. The researchers here, after presenting this data, they have said that we cannot make sense of it because the, the children are still asymptomatic. So that is how we would look at it as well, that fine, some hypercoagulable state occurred, but children actually handled it well. So don't know why this happened. If this happens in adults, we know hypercoagulable state occurs and we have a problem. This was a good question though, Vic. Uh, so Mariesta Dush says, if you test positive and have symptoms, should you start taking quercetin, zinc, vitamin D, etc.? So of course, I cannot directly say to anyone to take anything. So hypothetically, you should be, we should all be taking these things um, prophylactically. But if not, then yes, uh, as these symptoms occur. Again, talk with your doctor for yourself and look at what is right and what should be avoided. So then this is the Peggy Staley. This is the, what are your thoughts on this one? So WHO's, here is the link. What WHO say is saying here is the following. So IVD is the in vitro diagnostics. And this is something related to the cycle threshold. What WHO is saying here is that it is possible that with the RT-PCR, when the, the companies that sell RT-PCR kits, they may have in vitro for in vitro testing, they may have to do a lots of cycles to make sure that their test can detect the SARS-CoV-2, even if the amount of the RNA is really low. And this is a similar uh, message that I had a few days ago as well. Nobody actually knows what is the right threshold for it. What is the cutoff point of the viral load in our body that is bad versus not bad? And because of that, we don't really know what is the right cycle threshold as well. 
So here they are saying that ideally the cycle threshold should be adjusted as you learn more from the patients. So uh, I agree with this. Uh, Liberter says, is this game changer for seriously ill COVID patients? So I saw this one over here. Uh, what this article is saying is that this company, and again, I have no association with this company. What this article is saying that they have created a version of ivermectin or a solution of ivermectin that can be injected in our body uh, instead of given orally. So here, if you see here, intramuscular injection, and it increases its availability 500 times percent, and then sort of five times and 500 percent. And secondly, so look at this through sublingual strips compared to oral uh, data. The other thing is that it becomes available within 15 minutes compared to normal six hours of availability. So if somebody is seriously ill and need ivermectin right away, then they can use this. So I, I like it. Again, I have not tested it. Ideally, it should work the way they are saying. And if that is the case, then yes, it would be very helpful. The problem is convincing the doctors to actually use it. So then there is this uh, question from Bonnie. My friend's husband tested positive last week, so she got tested and was negative. She got sick and tested again, but tested negative again. How can this happen? She's still sick with COVID symptoms today. So um, <clears throat> I have seen this many times as well. A few days ago, I was treating a patient, husband and wife, and husband came back negative again and again, although he was the one who started with the symptoms. Then wife got the symptoms and she came back positive. And then it is interesting that afterwards, when the antibody tests were done, husband's antibody tests were positive and the wife's uh, antibody tests were not. So of course, there is... Um, some, <coughs> excuse me. So there is going to be some issue with the RT-PCR as well. I'm seeing a lot of uh, um, mistakes by the RT-PCR tests. So uh, I had done very early on, three, four months ago, I had done a, a discussion about the positive predictive value and negative predictive value. So generally, the way to think medically is that if somebody is in the area of an outbreak, which nowadays all of us are, and they have the symptoms of a specific disease of the outbreak, then you assume that that is the disease until proven otherwise. So if the symptoms are similar to COVID, then assume there is COVID and treat it accordingly instead of trying to make sure that the, the test is positive because the time, especially for COVID, we don't have time. It is very fast. So before I continue, on this side, I'm going to go to the live one. <clears throat> this is a good question. So how does it work with the uh, Epstein-Barr virus? So I'll, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Let's look at the live side. How, is, how are things here? <laughs> that is correct. So Dr. Drake says, WHO has been wrong on literally everything and multiple times since this began. I don't trust them. So number one, I like your uh, your picture. <laughs> it looks like you had been in Friends. Uh, and then, uh, or is it Grey's Anatomy? Uh, yes, WHO has been dropping the ball on so many things. I, I am disappointed in them. Catherine. Dalier, question, why do they assume there was no endothelial damage in the asymptomatic children with elevated markers? There were reports of blood clots after asymptomatic cases of a few young adults. So it is possible, yes. So the um, there were initially, remember there were COVID toes and then there were some uh, strokes indications as well. So there is possibility of hypercoagulable states as well. Uh, I did not have the research data itself to see what was the frequency of this? They simply said, we saw this patient was asymptomatic. They were OK. So this is not sufficient for me to be able to connect some dots. And by the way, I, we talked about it about four months ago, three months ago.
Yeah, so that is the problem, John Snyder. The FDA does not allow off-label use of ivermectin right now, so none of them. That's the thing. Uh, it is an off-label use. We were there were complaint about my system that Mubin is teaching off-label usage, and he should be stopped. And so then there were some people talking with me about it. But yeah, the problem is that FDA has deliberately or ignorantly not approved these things or not even looked into them. They don't even have a message on their side to say, you know what, we have seen following studies where they say ivermectin may be useful, so maybe you should try it. They don't even have that. They, they're just um, hopeless. So Thomas Rao say, Ru says, is it possible to get COVID twice? Having the virus enter in our body can be many times, correct? Because we are living in an environment where we are exposed. Make, having it cause disease. So reinfection technically is possible. Every time the virus enters our body, it is reinfection. Having it cause COVID disease again and again, that is very low frequency. So far, hundreds of patients out of millions of total cases. So uh, from data's point of view, your question's answer is yes. How much we should be worried? I think it is negligible uh, situation. Kurt Prigle says, question, can antibodies actually attack a viral particulate directly or does the particulate need to embed into a cell first? The spike carries the protective waxy coating that needs to break down prior to co-stimulation of the ACE2, believed to be done by the low-grade fever, making symptoms onset five one days on average. Can an antibody break down the protein covering of the spike? So good question. And there are two parts to the answer. So the first exposure and second exposure. So what happens is, so let's say the virus has arrived into our body for the first time. When the first time the virus arrives, the virus will have to connect with that ACE2 receptor. Of course, it needs TMPR SS2 to prime it and cut the spike protein to make it uh, connect with the cell's membrane plus the ACE2 enzyme. Once that has happened, then this virus particle has to go into the cell. Once it goes into the cell, normally what happens is if I make this membrane of the virus or the envelope in blue, mostly the virus would leave the envelope here. And this is where sometimes medical students or doctors, they come back and they say, man, Mubin, you do not know medicine. Who gave you a degree? It's not necessary always that it happens. And that's true. It is possible that sometimes the whole virus is brought in and then it sheds the RNA or RNA is brought out of the phagocytic or uh, pinocytic uh, vacuole. But most of the time it would leave the membrane out here and the RNA would come into the cell then that RNA would go to the ribosome and make proteins, viral proteins. These proteins will then be loaded. So uh, again, the virus's point is to make more viruses, but our cell's point is to use some of these proteins and present them outside and then activate the immune system. That is the first time. Uh, and this can take here the immediate reaction from the innate arm is within... 24, 48 hours. But that is not strong and robust enough in adults to take care of the virus. So then the virus continues to do its number on us. And the result is that more and more cells keep producing these things and that cause the, the immune system activation. So once the immune system has become activated, so here let's say B cells and here cytotoxic T cells, once they become activated, they're going to try to curtail the virus and, and clear it out. And so that happens, this happens the first time between seven to 14 days or even later. It's variable in various people. However, once our cell have become exposed, now they have also converted into memory cells. They're sleeping. So how do we make them sleeping? So they are sleeping, right? Uh, let's make them happy sleeping cells. So now they're sleeping. 
in their shelves in the lymph node. And then the virus arrives again, let's say a month later. Now these cells that were sleeping, they had their hands out. And as soon as they detect the virus, they would immediately wake up. They will open up their eyes and they say, oh man, the virus is back here. I'm going to start working. I already know how to how to work against this. And within 24 hours, they would start making antibodies or ramp up their antibody production and clear the virus. This is exactly how the vaccine is supposed to train our immune system as well. So going back to your question, Kurt, that do we need the, can the virus be attacked outside or not? It depends. First time, virus can be attacked outside by our innate arm. And then they pick it up and then they train our immune system. And then within seven to 14 days, our immune system would start making cytotoxic T cells, which would take care of the infected cells and antibodies, which would take care of this, the virus outside of cells. And the next time we would take care of it outside the cell. Some of it would go in the cell, but majority of it would be cleared out. So hopefully that answers your question. <clears throat> <laughs> Luffy has parasites. <laughs> yes, you get ivermectin. Um. <laughs> Luffy for CDC chief. Absolutely. I think he might do a better job. Uh. <laughs> Luffy should. Um, any other question? So there is a question by Simple Garden. Contrast reactivation versus immune disregulation. Ivermectin is used by some for long haulers. <clears throat> so the long hauler situation, I have been talking about it for a long time. That here is how I think it, and let's think together. In a long hauler, and please don't be offended if you don't look like this. In a long hauler, Eventually, what is happening is that, that the symptoms are present, correct? Now, the presence of the symptoms can be for many reasons. One reason is that the virus is still present. And so immune system is just continuously reacting to it. And that, from Bruce Patterson's discussion, it is possible that that is happening. The other possibility is that immune system has become dysregulated. It has forgotten to turn itself off. And now it has kind of become a autoimmune type disease. Hopefully not for a long time, but for some time. So if that is the case, then we need to shut it down. If it is a virus still present, but the person has actually made, mainly recovered, then I would say that very trace amounts of virus, small amounts of virus, or maybe a small amount of virus debris. For example, Dr. Bruce Patterson said the virus may be sitting in the monocytes that are sitting in the blood, and the virus trace amounts are in it. And that is how the virus is continuing to poke the immune system. Monocytes would become dendritic cells, or they would become macrophages when they go into the tissue. So monocytes, you can think of them as they are traveling in our blood. So they are traveling on railway lines. And when they come out of the train, that is a blood vessel, and go into the town, then they are called macrophages. And if these macrophages are already infected, then the macrophage would just keep producing cytokines and the immune system would stay dysregulated. Maybe the virus or its debris is present in other cells as well. However, here is an interesting thing. And unknowingly, uh, I had been treating patients unknowingly to this that exactly the virus is sitting in monocyte or where is it sitting? <coughs> Excuse me. The way I had al always thought about with my patients is they have the symptoms of immune system reacting. So I need to reset the immune system. So I used to use steroid therapy. So eventually, whatever is the underlying issue, uh, even from Bruce's uh, point of view, when I heard him, I, it actually told me that what I had been doing was actually good, that whatever is the reason, 
dysregulated immune system, you have to reset it and then bounce it. Just like you have to restart Microsoft Windows or virus sitting somewhere or the debris sitting somewhere causing immune system to become dysregulated, bounce it and let immune system become reset and energetic, energetic, A-N-E-R, not E-N-E-R. Energetic is where the immune system learns to ignore. So that is called energy. So I have been doing this with my patients and they always worked. And it was fun to hear Dr. Bruce Patterson that eventually he was also saying low, low uh, dose steroids for long time will help. So it is possible that in the future, there are more specific therapies that would go against, let's say, monocyte or that would go, go against some specific interleukin that is still running around. But uh, uh, steroids have been very useful. And this is why um, it is interesting for me that in the beginning of the year when I was treating patients, some of them will become um, long haulers. And then I would give them steroid therapy and they would come out of it. Nowadays, the newer set of patients, the doctors have learned to start steroids, in my opinion, wrongly very early, but none of them are becoming long haulers because the steroid, as much as there is a danger that it keeps the immune system suppressed and the virus is replicating, at the same time, immune system does not go dysregulated and they do not end up in the long hauling state. So that was very interesting for me to, to observe. So I hope, um, I so now the rule of uh, ivermectin, the use of ivermectin is as an anti-inflammatory and immune system modulator. But I actually think that better than ivermectin is steroid pulse. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Yo was funny that day. Uh, that is correct. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna. So there is a question from Anthony. If virus is in monocyte in long haulers, would thymosine? Alpha-1 work indirectly as antiviral to clear by immune boost. So the, <clears throat> unfortunately, monocyte has nothing to do with the thymosine and the th thymus gland and the T helper cells or the T cells. The thymosine works with the T cells specifically and it does not work with the innate arm at all. So monocytes are separately made in the bone, bone marrow, release in the blood, and then they go and become macrophages. The best would have to be uh, steroid. And then maybe tomorrow there would be therapies specifically directed against the subset of monocyte which is infected. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, <clears throat> So I'm going to answer. Thank you, Mini. So there's a question here, and then I'll go to uh, um, Twitter. Question, could the ingredients in Flonase contradict Ivermectin because it is a steroid? How long would one need to pause Flonase? And when would you want to stop Ivermectin and start methylprednisolin? <clears throat> so let's think about it. Flonase is going to work here locally. And let's say it is reducing the immune system's function. Let's think about it. Let's say we are giving steroids local. Although there are drugs that are for the nose which do not have steroids. But let's say we are giving immunosuppressants locally. Ivermectin is not affected by them because Ivermectin actually goes into the normal cells and prop them up and let them release interferons. And the steroids would not stop that. So number one, in the presence of steroids, ivermectin can still work. And this is what I'm seeing in some of the countries that they are giving, for example, ivermectin doxycycline with steroid. As much as I do not like steroid in the beginning, they are doing this cocktail right in the beginning and people are not becoming long haulers. 
So then the second part of your question, how long would one need to pause Flonase? And when would you want to stop the ivermectin and start methylprednisolone? So I, there is no, um, I do not, for my patients, I keep ivermectin going. And when I start steroids, I keep the pulse going as well. Because ivermectin has a different role to play and steroids have a different role to play. Steroid has to uh, calm down the immune system. Ivermectin has to shore up the normal tissues where the virus is going and tell them to stay strong. So they, they both are kind of partners in work, but not contraindicated to each other. MM says, hi doc, can after battling COVID successfully, the WBC count and lymphocyte count can get lower than normal or that has no relationship. So we are seeing that the uh, WBC count actually becomes lower and then it would start rising up again. So Harry Hart, I had to block you turtle you are blocked as well and then some flower person you are blocked as well okay <clears throat> um there's a question thrill thank doc thank doc okay so does a two-day covert cough produce enough t and b cells for a future covert fight so the two-day cough doesn't mean um anything in terms of the immune's behavior. This simply means that your body was able to take care of the virus very quickly. This would also mean that yes, your T and B cells over the longer period of time, which is more than two days, probably seven to 10 days later, it would become activated as well. And yes, it would help you in the future. If you have already taken care of it in two days, next day, next time when it comes in, you would not even know. So how about if we can answer? So uh, Tara has a question here. Uh, <clears throat> what is the prognosis for long, <coughs> excuse me, long COVID cases? So the so far, touch word, uh, all of my long COVID cases have recovered. And they usually, one case was who went on for three, four months. And I had to give repeated steroids, but then eventually it came out. Everybody else who developed it, developed the long COVID, I gave them the pulse and they became okay as well. There is one more person who is my patient, developed the long COVID, and it is very cyclical. For example, uh, once a month, it kind of, um, they become sick or have fever or have uh, GIT issues. And I said, this is long COVID, do this, and they refused. So they still continue to have that cycle. So in my opinion, if treated correctly, it should become, um, it should go away. And that is what Dr. Bruce Patterson was saying as well, that eventually either the immune system would become energic, that means it would start ignoring the virus, and the long hauler symptoms would go away, or we would treat it and the symptoms would go away. <clears throat> done <laughs> locked pain block them question what topics do you have hope to cover in lectures post covid that's a very good question skyfly uh, so my mission when i started teaching was that i feel that the medical professionals nurses doctors have to have clear medical concepts they have to understand medical concepts in easy and practical way that was my belief for that. I was actually working on uh, doing the lectures. So we have now on Dr. Bean about 800 lectures other than COVID. And now we have done 240 COVID lectures as well. So once the pandemic is over, I am going back to doing those lectures, diabetes, kidney diseases, um, 
pulmonology and so on. So other medical concepts, we'll continue to talk about them. So with this, let's look at some of the um, Twitter things as well. So this is actually a very good question. How does COVID reactivate Epstein-Barr virus? I am a long hauler and my EBV reactivated. I don't even know which symptoms are long COVID and which are EBV. So the first question for you, life is beautiful. That is, how did you know that your EBV is reactivated? So one way is that let's say <clears throat> you had Epstein-Barr virus at some point in your life. Let's say here, some point, day zero. When that happened, in a few days, seven to 14 days, you developed IgM against the antigens from the EBV. Then those IgM went down and IgG, IgG was started getting produced and it stayed up and it would stay up almost for the whole life. It might decline, but it would be up. Now, if the EBV becomes reactivated, the indication for that will be that IgM will go up again because IgM is usually for acute infection. IgG is for chronic uh, memory B cells working. So if your IgM has gone back up after being negative, then that means there is a reactivation. So now the question is why the reactivation occurs. This is a very simple thing. Many of us, when we get one infection, we also get the other infection because our immune system becomes exhausted. Our immune system is fighting. Our immune system is busy. Our cells are dying and the numbers are low. They are, they are less energy in them. They, they are called exhausted. So when an immune system is exhausted, it has kept other things at bay. Those opportunistic, we call them opportunistic pathogens, those opportunistic things can bounce back and they can start causing issues. So it is possible that when the immune system goes down during the um, SARS-CoV-2, at that time, EBV or other such viruses, which are just sitting around, they can bounce back. If they have bounced back, they will go back again because our immune system had taken care of them before as well. So that was a that is a good question. <clears throat> Matt, thank you. I wouldn't call it debunked. So there is another uh, question here, which is very, very interesting. And that is here. Matt says, good evening, sir. I stumbled upon a fascinating article that could be related to long haulers, would love to hear your thoughts. So I have it here, here. I believe this is the one, this one. <laughs> so it is a dangerous article to read and a slightly misleading as well. The article says this, that the researchers have found evidence that there is reverse transcription of the SARS-CoV-2 virus RNA and that means it has now become integrated into our DNA. The problem with this is that they have not actually shown the virus to be integrated in the DNA. So here is what is happening. So let's say, <clears throat> and so this is a um, test they did in a, in a lab. So let's say here in the lab, we have a bunch of cells. Our, our cells. <clears throat> and then they bring in SARS-CoV-2 and put the SARS-CoV-2 here in this area as well. Then what they do is they take some material from here and they test that for uh, with RT-PCR or other ways to see what kind of RNA they are seeing. Now, please remember, at least I think cool beans are very clear on this one, that RNAs are in the cytoplasm. RNAs do not go in the nucleus. And if they are in the cytoplasm, and if you do the testing on them, you can find them. If we are going to make a assumption, an assumption, that somehow the DNA has changed, then there is a very simple way to know if the DNA has changed. And that simple way is to pick up our DNA. So let's say this is our DNA. And please know that DNA can be tested separately from RNA. Here is a DNA, and this is our normal DNA structure. 
known structure. So I'm just going to put some numbers here. Let's say this is A area, B, I'm simplifying it, C, D, and E. This is, let's say, a normal pattern of some chromosome. And we researchers come back and they say, you know what? In the area C, we now have the viral DNA present here. That means we should be able to do a test on the DNA where we look for the pattern A, B, C, D, and E, and we cannot see it. And if we look for a pattern A, B, instead of C, virus gene, virus gene, and then D and E. If we look for this, we would find it. So the researchers actually did not find any DNA sequenced changed, but they found a lot of RNAs, which is fine. <laughs> that is okay. And they found a lot of reverse transcriptase activity as well. That is also okay because we have the reverse transcriptase enzyme present in these cells. And so they are working. That does not actually prove anything that it is actually in the DNA or it has changed the DNA. So this was a rather <clears throat> incorrect assumption. So this was good. Actually, it was fun to read it. And this tells me that how even researchers can misrepresent things. And then it becomes difficult for common man or woman to look at it and then make sense of it. Even doctors will have to go in and look at the data and then say, OK, this is how the reverse transcriptase work. This is if you want to prove that DNA is changed, these are the kind of tests you need to do. But they did the RNA test, which is on the cytoplasm. That does not prove that DNA is changed. So you have to do those things to arrive at a point to say this study is not correct. So not every doctor would do it. Tony Karalikas, cool beans, could long haulers be suffering from CIRS? So here, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. <clears throat> so what is happening in this one is, um, and let me show the mechanism that people have been postulating. Here is the mechanism. The <clears throat> To make it simpler, I'm going to explain it here. The mechanism is that let's say we have virus, some virus gene here. Let's say spike protein. I'm just picking up something as an example. Some genetic, uh, some uh, antigenic part of the virus. That part, when it arrives in our body, it learns or it can connect with our receptors that detect the pathogens, for example. And we have talked about it, toll-like receptors or uh, pattern matching receptors or PAMs. So there are many kind of receptors on our cells that can pick up antigens, especially on macrophages, dendritic cells, neutrophils, and so on. So they are saying that sometimes these guys just become connected here. And when they become connected permanently, they would keep tickling the macrophage, for example. And the macrophage would just keep producing cytokines. And these cytokines then in turn would continue to activate the immune system. And that causes the, for example, in SARS-CoV-2, long hauling. So uh, <clears throat> there is a very simple uh, response. So number one, continuous inflammatory response is actually a fact. There are people who have it. But this theory is not that accurate. The reason for that is very, very simple. The reason is these cells. So let's say this is a macrophage. This is a macrophage. And with this macrophage, somehow this antigen has become bound. So imagine with me, some sort of a pathogen has come and gotten attached and is just hanging around with me. Macrophages usually die after doing some function. For example, a macrophage can phagocytose 100 other cells, or it can eat 100 times, and then it becomes old and it dies. Then other macrophages would eat this guy. So that means a macrophage, for example, that has gotten a coating of the toxin on its receptor, which is continuously poking it. This is like somebody. Uh, 
put their hand or their finger on the doorbell and do not remove the hand, and now the doorbell is just going and going and going, the problem is this macrophage is going to be di dying within a day or two. Then the new macrophage will have to come in. And if that is the case, that new macrophage will have to be, um, the new macrophage will have to be uh, getting this coating as well. So this can only happen in those cases where the antigen is continuously present. And then if we look at long haulers, yes, there is, if you look at from the surface, there are symptoms. That means there is something happening inside, either the virus debris or the virus is continuously present, or the immune system has forgotten how to calm itself down. But this exact mechanism will not be very much possible with SARS-CoV-2 because the immune system cells that are working will keep getting replenished. They would die and the new cells would come in. So then continuing on. Good question, Tony. This was interesting. Uh, so Brooklyn Northrup, did I spell Luffy's name correctly? Yes. So. Uh, Luffy, uh, I think you, you had this question about Luffy and uh, here. Hello from Boston. Hello back. How old is Luffy? Luffy is six years. How did Luffy get his name? Um, because uh, of the manga character and the Kairi got her name from a game. Where did Luffy come from? So uh, we live in California in Cupertino. So I think we had to go about three year, three hours drive to someone who breed Bengal cats and Bengal cats, I think you have to be certified to breed them. So then um, we got it from there. Do you have any other cats? Yes. So we have Kairi as well. I showed the pictures in the beginning. And yes, you, uh, Luffy, L-O-O-F-Y is what we say. Zubair says, question, does previously infected people need some same dose of COVID-19 vaccine? Yes. If they take it, then the same dose. And honestly, if they are healthy and they have taken care of the, the infection, correctly before, they may not need the vaccine. All right, so before I go here, let's look at some of the questions here on the live side. And Luffy is here. Hey, Luffy. <laughs> he just jumped on the table. So Debbie says EBV reaction, reactivation diagnosis information was not correct. We may have IgM rise again, but the early antigen IgG is specific test that shows reactivation of EBV virus with or without IgM. Important info that no, uh, not all doctors seem to know. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so again, the early IgG with IgM. Um, So then there's a question from TD, long haulers have got gut endothelial damage. Gut endothelial, gut endothelial, gut epithelial, gut, gut has epithelium, the blood vessels have endothelium. And gut's epithelium is, is changed very often, but we have seen that in, long, uh, in the COVID patients, I won't say long haulers, in COVID patients, uh, the COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2 can sit in the gut epithelium for up to 59, 60 days afterwards. There was a study that I had mentioned a few days ago where they said that gut epithelium contained the debris of the SARS-CoV-2 for months afterwards, which continued to cause the B cell to become more and more uh, mature in fighting with the SARS-CoV-2. The question is, can that also cause long hauling symptoms? So far, I haven't heard that. <clears throat> okay, so um, once again, going to the uh, to the uh, this area, Twitter. Zubair says, "Question: If someone has post-COVID ra raised D dimers, two, three, fours, without any symptoms of infection or DVT." 
does he need blood thinners as isolated D dimers are usually misleading in clinical scenarios, age 65. So Zubair, this seems to be a very, very specific question. The If I was managing a patient, I would actually see if the D dimers are going downwards or upwards. If they are going downwards, then body is taking care of it and you let it take care of itself. But if they're going upwards, then yes, the um, thinners may be needed, but you talk with the doctor and do it. So trend in some um, biomarkers, trend is more important than a snapshot. And then there is this uh, Kobayashi Maro, COVID-19 associated olfactory dysfunction, reveals SARS-CoV-2 neuroinvasion and persistence in the olfactory system. So Kobayashi, yes, we, here is the, here is the study. And we talked about it very early on. What they're talking about is we conducted a biological molecular. So what they're saying here is that SARS-CoV-2 can infect the olfactory area, epithelium and the nerves, and then that is how it causes loss of smell. They have actually said that it is also possible that it causes infection of the neurons. The study that I saw earlier that we discussed, that study said that neurons are actually safe from SARS-CoV-2. However, the supporting cells, and I remember I drew a diagram for that as well, the supporting cells around the neuron, those cells had, so let's say if this is a neuron, then the supporting cells that are present around it, epithelial cells and other cells here, these cells can become infected by the SARS-CoV-2. So when they become infected by it, they cause local inflammation. And of course, that also impacts the nerve. And that is how the sense of smell goes away. So if you see here, finally, olfactory mucosa sampling in COVID-19 patients presenting with persistent loss of smell reveals the presence of virus transcripts, that means pieces, and of SARS-CoV-2 infected cells. That means cells inside the uh, SARS-CoV-2 inside the cells, together with the protracted inflammation. So, of course, if the SARS-CoV-2 is going to stay here, then the body's immune system is going to keep reacting as well, and there will be inflammation. That inflammation would cause the nerves to not work correctly. Viral persistent in the olfactory epithelium. Epithelium. Epithelium means the surface area. This area. Epithelium is therefore provides a potential mechanism for prolonged or relapsing symptoms of COVID-19, such as loss of smell, which should be considered for optimal medical management and future therapeutic strategies. So absolutely, and we talked about it before as well, that this is what happens and that is how sense of smell goes away. Um, so that is that one. Kobayashi Maro says, how likely is this reactivation? How often does something like this happen? So here, I think this is again a similar question about the reactivation. Where is it? So this is also a question about the reactivation of other viruses, for example, shingles, mono, or herpes. So they can be. Whenever our immune system becomes busy and becomes exhausted, it is possible that other things that are sitting in us can bounce back. Dallas for life 44 question if a person was taking all of the prophylactic supplements that have been discussed would it potentially weaken the vaccine response so that it doesn't stimulate the immune system enough not at all actually you may have seen that the supplements that we had been talking about are modulators so they actually optimize the immune system to react correctly and that is why what i've seen is that folks who get the infection while they were taking various supplements their infection actually is controlled easily and the symptoms are lesser. That doesn't mean that immune system was not working. That actually means immune system worked so efficiently that without a lot of tissue damage, immune system was able to take care of the virus. That is the same thing that is going to happen with the vaccine as well. So the these things would actually help vaccine train our immune system in a better way. Jess McCarthy says, can you talk about what is currently what is currently known 
regarding etiology and pathogenesis of the development of autoantibodies to specific parts of the body in some long holders. Could this be related to viral persistence or does it seem more likely to be consequence of la long holder immune response? So just the first question is that I haven't yet heard autoantibodies against tissues in long haulers. I know that there is cytokine uh, storms or cytokine release and I know that there is antibody against these uh, SARS-CoV-2. I haven't heard that in long haulers and that, that may be my ignorance and so I would be happy if I can get some links to look at. I haven't heard that autoimmune system develops. If that is the case then we have a different kind of a problem. Because then, as you're saying, it is possible that some tissue is going to get damaged because we have autoantibodies against them. I think it is mostly the immune system reacting to the virus debris or immune system forgetting to stop itself. In both cases, if you give steroid pulse, normally immune system comes back to its senses. But uh, I may be wrong, so I would love to see some link. Uh, Atlas, the Husky says, should ivermectin for COVID-19 prophylaxis be taken with food or on empty stomach? Have seen for other indications for it to be, have seen for other indications for it to be taken on an empty stomach. Does it matter? I have usually never said to take with or without food. So whatever, without food is fine. With food is okay as well. I haven't seen any specific reasons to stop it. So <clears throat> one more here and then I'll come back to the live side. I hope everybody is doing okay. Uh, so what do you think about this study, Kobe Ashumaro? The S1 protein of SARS-CoV-2 crosses the blood-brain barrier. So uh, I have the study here, study or the um, or this research. And I wanted us to kind of not be um, nervous with this study because here is the deal. <clears throat> The study is to take the spike protein and then inject it into the veins or into the blood to allow it to go towards the blood-brain barrier. And normally that is not what happens with the uh, SARS-CoV-2. Actual SARS-CoV-2 does not do this. It does not shed the protein, the spikes. That means if the spike is the hand of the SARS-CoV-2, the hands are not secreted from the, the SARS-CoV-2. Similarly, when the SARS-CoV-2 is in our, in our cell, the cells do not spill or secrete SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins. These are presented on the surface. And when the cell is damaged and it is dead, then that would spill out the whole SARS-CoV-2 without the spike protein separately secreted. So even when in theory, injecting the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein only causes it to cross blood-brain barrier, this will not happen with the virus. And I know that there is going to be a question that, hey, we are going to give SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins in vaccines. But remember, we are not giving this uh, the vaccine uh, antigens. We are giving messenger RNA. Messenger RNA will have to go to a cell. Then over there, it will have to help manufacture the spike proteins, which will be loaded on MSC1 or MSC2 and presented on the surface. They will not be secreted by the cell. If that was going to be happening, then the people, about 70, 80,000 people who are taking part in uh, Pfizer and Moderna, they would have a lot of problem. Because here, what they proved is that if you just inject the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in the blood, it would just go and cross the blood-brain barrier. So that phenomena is not going to happen in live us humans. So it is interesting though. <clears throat> so let's look at some of the things on the live side. So this is a, um, so, and Trinsec, what should I do against a, a, for a patient who had a STEMI with COVID? So all the all the uh, management of STEMI with, of course, uh, the management for COVID. So uh, again, I cannot specifically talk about one patient. I do not know their labs. I do not know their history. I'm not their doctor. But of course, if they have STEMI infarction going on, you manage that first and then you look at why is that happening. It is possible that it is the SARS-CoV-2 that is causing the damage, or it is possible that they have a supra 
due to some stress, there is something else going on as well. Possibly hypercoagulability by SARS-CoV-2. So Al Resu says, is it, it is, is it important that virus SARS-CoV-2 19 is not isolated and that the PCR test was not created to identify various according to Professor Mullis. So <laughs> I have gotten this. This is the most common comment that I receive as well on our videos that this is a hoax and it is not isolated. What I do not know is what do they mean by isolation? We had done here in the cool beans in our discussions, we had done a video where we actually watched in an electron microscopic view of the SARS-CoV-2 and how it was building new viruses. And it was such a fascinating thing to see at that microscopic, ultra microscopic level, that how this virus was manufacturing more viruses and how it is getting its spike proteins and everything. And I would actually suggest that you look that up as well. Just do a Google about electron microscopic uh, videos of SARS-CoV-2 and you would see them both in black and white and then they had colored them as well for us to understand better. That is one. Secondly, the genetic marker for the SARS-CoV-2 are always available and when we get the SARS-CoV-2 it is, it is in us as well. You can isolate it from there too. So this concept that it is not isolated is actually an incorrect, this is a disinformation. So Nightwatch says nobody is dying. It's all cases now. The, the news is practically owned by Big Pharma. So Nightwatch, that's not really true. People are dying. I, my One of my friends is on ventilator at this time. So it's just not right to do this kind of a thing. OK, Flower, I'm sorry if I incorrectly blocked you. I do not know how to unblock you. Um, Coolbean381, how many months after COVID will antibody tests show positive? Um, within 7 to 14 days, it should start manufacturing the antibodies. In some people, it can be late. Some people can be early, but usually 7 to 14 days window. So Hector says, question, I've been on PrEP for years. I heard some people saying that those taking antivirals of any kind might be able to prevent COVID from developing into sickness. Is there any truth to this? So a couple of things. Many of the antivirals are actually targeted at the virus's behaviors. For example, many viruses fuse with our membrane and then enter the membrane. So there are some antivirals that can strengthen the membrane of our cells. So yes such antivirals will help against other viruses and SARS-CoV-2, although we have seen they do not did not work very well. Similarly, there are some antivirals that are against RDRP enzyme in general of the viruses, whichever virus is bringing it in. And so if you give anti-RDRP enzyme antivirals, they should in theory work against SARS-CoV-2 as well. And we saw that they, are, they had mixed um, efficacy. They did not really work very well. And antivirals that were present before were actually not very well working either. So in theory, antivirals should be able to work if they are targeted towards the behavior of SARS-CoV-2 and other cells have such, be uh, viruses have such behavior. But fortunately, we have now more specific uh, medication for this. So um, after COVID symptomatic exposure, is it necessary to get the COVID vaccine? Be safe or is it 
redundant. <clears throat> so in my opinion, if you're healthy afterwards, so no immunosuppressants are taken, no immune system issues occurred, uh, and no SARS-CoV-2 mutations occurred, then what you have gotten is sufficient. It should protect you. Uh, but if for some reason immune system went down or immunosuppressants are taken or somehow there is a new SARS-CoV-2 thing that you're not infected with, then taking vaccine may be useful. So generally, if I was infected and I had developed antibodies, I would not care for the vaccine. So Roman says, is it uh, true that these vaccines only last for six months? No. So we don't actually know. I had given this answer in the beginning as well. Two answers. Technically, we don't know because we haven't spent enough time with them. Uh, from previous observations, two to three years, and some cytotoxic T cell can be for decades. So I think the data would still have to come in. But my hope is that the um, coverage is going to be for two to three years. Cool. So some more. Oh, we, we are almost two hours into it. So <clears throat> Kobayashi Maro has one more thing here. LL37 fights SARS-CoV-2, the vitamin D inducible peptide. So here is that study, LL37. What this study is saying, Kobayashi, thank you very much for sharing it. What they are saying here is that on the... So let's say this is a SARS-CoV-2 pathogen. We know that the spike protein has to bind with the ACE2 enzyme, correct? So this is a spike protein. They're saying that we have a peptide in our body called LL37. Is that the name? LL37, yes. That can bind with the spike protein. And so if we have lots of LL37, it would kind of bind with the spike proteins and render the, the virus unable, unable to connect with S2 and get into our cells. So what they said was vitamin D can actually increase the production of LL37. And by that mechanism, it can actually cause reduction of the viral entry into our cells. So good study. I have to read up about LL37 and the vitamin D's behavior with it. But from on the face of it, they are saying that vitamin D, they're almost going to almost antiviral behavior. So it is a jump. I have not heard about this before. So I like the study. I would have to do some more research. But this is what they're saying in general. It is very interesting if that is what is happening. We know that vitamin D is useful. I just do not know about this mechanism. So uh, Kobayashi Maro, uh, endothelial cells are not directly vulnerable to infections by SARS-CoV-2 and endothelial dysfunction is entirely indirect. So that is here. And uh, I had done this discussion a few months ago. It is not the SARS-CoV-2 directly damaging the endothelium of the blood vessel. Instead, what it does is that as the ACE2 and ACE enzymes um, balances, uh, it is imbalanced once we have the ACE2 connections. That is when the inflammation goes rampant and then hypercoagulable state occurs. So here in this case as well, what they're saying is that in the blood vessels, they did not see the ACE2 expression sufficient to say that the SARS-CoV-2 is connecting and infecting the cell. But I think that is a theory that was not generally accepted. It was not that the SARS-CoV-2 was infecting the cells. It was that the there was an imbalance between ACE2's behavior and ACE1. And as these two functions became disrupted, more um, inflammation occurred. That inflammation caused the hypercoagulable state to occur. So that is indirect. And we talked about it many months ago. They are talking about it as well, which is an interesting thing. It's a good thing. <clears throat> uh, there is one more. This is very interesting that, uh, again, Kobayashi Maru, he says, what do you think about this, that 
the ivermectin connects with the SARS-CoV-2 spike binding domain. So here is what they're saying. And this is a computer study. So this is not an in vitro or in vivo study. This is a study in a computer simulation. So what they are saying is that we are seeing, so let's say this is once again SARS-CoV-2, and these are the spike protein, and here is the ACE2 enzyme, ACE2, ACE2. What they're saying is that they have seen that if you give ivermectin, it binds here between these two guys with more affinity. So in our body, in our biological system, there is a uh, there is a concept that whoever has more affinity for something wins. For example, here ACE2 enzyme wants to bind with this as well, and ivermectin wants to bind in this area as well. So whoever has a higher energy to bind will have a chance to bind. So they said that in computer simulation, they saw that ivermectin has a higher binding affinity in this region when SARS-CoV-2 and ACE2 are present, which in turn causes the virus to become in, unable to bind with the cell and enter it. This again is a new uh, theory. It is not proved in vitro or in vivo, but we are also not very much clear that how exactly is uh, ivermectin working. So maybe this is one of the mechanism as well. And I have that here. And this mechanism is also, I have the description as well. And I believe this is the last question. Uh, Stephen, if a person due to cost could only take one of the supplements thank, that you have talked about in your lectures, which one would be the best benefit? So whenever I become lazy about the supplements, the ones that I really, really always take are the vitamin D with the magnesium, with vitamin K2, calcium if needed. These are the must ones that I have. I also take vitamin B1 for sure as well. And what I do is usually I just take a multivitamin tablet as well. So this is something that I, in the when I'm totally lazy and I don't want to open 10, I do at least this much. NS may says there is already a, a confusion at the federal level on the amount of vaccines to be delivered. What if the second doses come late past the 21 days? How would the, the that affect those that need the second dose? I don't know exactly. In the Moderna study, there were some people who actually came in late and got the second dose, but they still had the good response. In theory, I would think it would be the same way. The, the question is, how late can they come and still get the second dose and still get the proper immune systems boosting? I do not know that, and there is no data in their studies as well. My hope will be that on logistical side, they will be more careful that they make sure that this does not happen. But there can be people who are not compliant as well. They take the first dose and they go away and then they come back, let's say two months later and say, now I need the second dose. Um, K-pop super strong. Can you explain what was wrong with the Australian vaccine? So K-pop, I actually read about this one for the first time here. So I will have to go dig into it that why did it give false uh, positives for HIV? It is interesting but I'll have to look into it. Um, <clears throat> COVID US org, we talked about Bell's palsy. Uh, that is still something that is up in the air. Is it possible that the cases of Bell's palsy are related to that vaccine, Pfizer's? Bell's palsy was reported by four. So it is possible that the, uh, the vaccine caused it. What they said was our data is inconclusive. The rate of Bell's palsy is the same as in general population. So. <clears throat> because they didn't reveal more, I am unable to talk about it. I feel bad about it because I would want to know more. Helen Knox says, what's the mechanism that causes awful pain behind the eyes? I couldn't explain it as I can other things now. Niece's son improving after six days of that and bad headache, but still coughing. I'm in the UK, no early treatment prescribed boys 20s. So the I know that it causes eye pain or pain behind the eyes and irritation in the eyes. The exact mechanism, I do not know that, is it the blood supply or is it the irritation for the muscles and the swelling of the tissue there? Or is it the nerve, nervous system irritation? Um, I'm very sorry, I do not know this mechanism. 
uh, Kelly V says, we also found in a specific subpopulation in monocytes and we found it in long haulers. Dr. Bruce Patterson, in your opinion, what does this mean for us long haulers? Are we doomed? No. So Kelly, uh, as uh, you heard from Dr. Bruce Patterson as well, what happens is our immune system is quite robust that it starts becoming energic. Energic means it starts ignoring something that has been sitting there for a long time. Number one. Number two, please remember monocytes would die as well. So they would come out from the bone, bone marrow, then they would be in the blood, then they would go and take residence in somewhere in the tissue. Over there, they would do some function. And after about 100 phagocytosis, they would die. So these monocytes should eventually clear out. A bigger problem will be that the bone marrow that is making the monocytes, if that bone marrow is infected and every new monocyte made is infected already, then we have a problem, but there is no, um, no evidence of that so far. So no, you're not doomed. Dr. Bruce Patterson said that as well, that this would recover. So long haulers would actually recover. It says that they need help. <clears throat> Cool. So that side is done. Um, how are things here? And then we stop. So thank you, Margaret. Uh, I hope it is a long session. So uh, TD says, can we mRNA replicate Dr. Bean? <laughs> yes, clone. Um, cool. So any other thing here before we stop? So Anthony, uh, it does say that there was HIV false positive, but I did not know exactly what was going on. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. So I think this is what we have for today. Thank there is a question. I just saw a question. Uh, Jan Elderton, question, if ivermectin binds to ACE2, would this affect blood pressure? So they are saying that not alone to ACE2, but with the spike protein present and with the ACE2, then ivermectin has a chance to bind with both of them. So again, this is a computer simulation. I would not put too much into it. There are many computer sim simulations of this type. So Kelly, yes, uh, Luffy has appeared live a couple of times. I was trying to get him in today, but my uh, wife said that he was running around and she couldn't catch him. So I'll try to get him in maybe tomorrow. So we'll, we'll talk with Luffy. <laughs> cool. So guys, thank you very much for your time today. Um, have a great evening or morning or day. Thank you very much for being here. Please like, subscribe, and share. There is buy me a coffee and there is a paypal donation button in the description if you wanted to uh, donate or support this work and i would see you tomorrow <laughs>